Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? Um, like I said, I've got about six different topics on how to integrate um, Google Apps into your class. Um, some of them are about how to integrate Google Apps within Nika specifically, and the others are just sort of best practices on things you can do that may or may not involve Nika. Um, we're going to be talking about Google Docs a lot. We're going to be talking a little bit about your Google Calendar. And then as we get further and further into the session, we're going to start talking about Google Hangout and what you can do with that. Um, so that's sort of uh, the broad scope of today's session. Um, if you're not already either at Miami or at My Miami, go there now. Um, we're going to start with My Miami and Nika. Uh, what I'm going to show you on the screen is a finished product of what you can do with Google Apps when you integrate it into Nika. Once we talk about the finished product, then we'll dig deeper into how to actually make that happen. Um, for your particular class, okay? Um, so for the time being, you can you know, feel free to watch what I'm doing and what I'm showing you because um, um, there's not really much for you to do until we get into the actual step-by-step -step how to replicate these things, okay? So I'm logged into a Nika course site as a student. This is what your student is going to see when everything is said and done, all right? So you'll see I don't have a lot of things on the left-hand side. It's because I'm not using a lot for this particular training. Um, but there are three things I wanted to point out to you. The first is I have a syllabus. Okay, you may already be using the syllabus tool. I'm going to show you how to use it a little bit differently. Um, office hours. Okay, I'm going to talk about how to how to do off, uh, uh, office hours inside your NEEC course, and then a student information form. Okay, many of you probably at the beginning of the semester have some sort of a form that you pass out to your students. You ask them to fill out and turn in such as their name, maybe what their major is, where they're from, why they're taking the class, maybe of interest to you. This, will, this uh, course site actually has students fill out that information online, so you already have it in a spreadsheet when you get it back. Okay. So we're going to start really simple, and that is with the syllabus. Okay, that's sort of the baseline for this. What you probably already do is you use the syllabus tool, or maybe even the resources tool, to upload a PDF or a Word document to your course. Okay. Then, let's say that that uh, syllabus is maybe 10 pages long. It may have your basic contact information, some university policies, some department policies, maybe you have your course calendar in there as well. Okay, not uncommon. Oftentimes in a document that long, students have a hard time finding what it is that they're specifically looking for. So we're gonna talk about how to make your syllabus interactive. Okay, so it's easy for them to find the information. So in a finished product, if I were to click on syllabus as a student, what you're going to see is instead of me uploading a copy of my document to Nika, I have the syllabus embedded within this page. Okay, so if I scroll down here, you see I've got course communications, some deadlines, attendance policies. Okay, I've got the grading procedures, and then at the bottom I have the course schedule. Okay, not uncommon, but I'm not uploading any files into Nika. There's nothing for the students to download. They click on the syllabus, and that's it, it's right in front of them. Okay. Now, let's say this document, I think this document may be like six pages long, so it's kind of short in my opinion. But up at the top, let's say a student comes here and they really want to know what the course schedule is. Okay. Maybe they're trying to figure out what we're covering next week in class. Instead of having to skim through this whole document, they can go to a table of contents, click on course schedule, and it takes them right there. Okay. On top of that, Let's go back to the course schedule as an example. We all know that this is, if, you know, a course schedule at the beginning of the semester is sort of a utopian universe, okay? You're inevitably gonna get behind in your schedule, and so you're gonna need to make changes, okay? You only have to make those changes once in this Google Doc. You never have to relink the syllabus to Nika again. Everything is updated in real time, okay? So it saves you steps from having to re-upload a new PDF or a new Word document and ensuring that you have the most recent version up there. Okay, you make the changes once and the students see it immediately. Okay, so that's sort of how, how that looks from a student perspective. Students don't need to be logged in to Google Docs in order to be able to see this. Okay, they can print the document if they actually want a hard copy. Okay, they don't have to download anything, then open it and then print it. They can print it right from the screen. All right, so we'll walk through how to create that type of a document in a little bit. And additionally, how many of you have um, uh, hold office hours and you oftentimes get no students that show up for your office hours? And oftentimes, I mean probably most of the time. All right. 
Wouldn't it be great to know who's planning on coming to your office hours ahead of time? Okay. So what if I were to click on office hours here as a student? And of course I have pop-ups turned uh, blocked. If I were to click on office, oh, come on. This goes back to the problem you were having, Janice, not being logged into Google first. Okay, let's try that one. Do you like that better than the sign up function? Um, I actually have not played a whole lot with it at this point. Um, it, there are some benefits to using this, the, what I'm showing you right now. And I'll walk through sort of what those benefits are in a minute. Okay, but as a student, I can open up an office hours scheduling sheet. Okay, this is a Google Calendar, basically. If I had events on my calendar as a student, they would appear here so that I made sure that I didn't you know, double book myself. But if I skip ahead to next week, let's say I wanted to talk to my professor, my professor has office hours on Friday. Okay, from it appears 8:30 to uh, probably noon, 12:30. Okay, these are in 15-minute blocks, so I can just sign up for an office hour when it fits my schedule. When you click on one, it it lets you book an appointment. So office hours. John Smith is the name of the um, the student account that I'm using right now, so it would show up as your student's actual name there. Um, when, uh, where, this is pre-filled in by the instructor so the student knows where the office hour is located. And then description. I have a little prompt in here that I can have my students go in and say, um, I want to discuss the last test. So that you know before the student gets there exactly what their question is. Okay. When the student's ready, they can click save and it says your appointment has been saved. What Google does is it sends a calendar invite to the instructor and the student to put it on both of their calendars. So the instructor knows exactly who is coming during which times and what they plan to talk about. Okay, yeah, Perry. Real quick, real, real quickly, uh, for those of us who, in addition to our office hours, sometimes to accommodate students at TBA, do we still need to put a range of times yeah, what you can do is, unfortunately, you do have to specify a time range that the hours will exist. Um, but when somebody sends you, when somebody books an appointment for you, it sends you a calendar invite. And if you find out, uh, you know what, I have a, another meeting I have to go to and I have to cancel, you can just cancel that appointment and it will send the student a notification saying that you're no longer available during that time. Okay, yeah. Um, does it send reminders and can you turn it, can you say, okay, if no one schedules like an hour beforehand, block it off? Yeah, you as the instructor can go into the, the booking area where you create the office hours and just hit delete on your, on your personal calendar. And that removes the office hours from your calendar and then no longer allows students to book during that time. Sign up lets you automate. You can't automate, yeah. But, but unfortunately, the sign up does not integrate directly within your Google Calendar. So if, you're, so if you're using it for you know, a variety of purposes, it's nice to have that all integrated into one system. As far as reminders go, that just depends on the user. So as a student, do I have reminders turned on on my Google Calendar? If so, then yes, it will send you a reminder, but that's on a per user basis. Okay. All right, the third thing that I'm gonna uh, demonstrate for you is uh, I mentioned a student information form. So if you pass out a sheet of paper or you ask students to email you some information about themselves um, to help you get a better feel for why students are in the class, you may then have to take that information, type it into your computer, save it, do whatever with it. What I've done is I've created an electronic version of that directly in my NEEC course. Okay, so the first day of class I can tell students one of your assignments is to complete this form. And if a student clicks on that, it has an embedded form directly within NECA. They don't have to go anyplace. Okay. They also don't have to be logged into Google in order to do this. Okay. So all I can do is I can you know, type in name. Um, maybe they, their name is Joseph, but they prefer Joe. So you can do that in here. Um, where are you from? What do you like about the, the subject area? What you'll notice is that I have multiple types of questions. So I have text questions. I have multiple choice questions. You can do drop down. You can do a scale or a matrix. There's a lot of different options that you have when creating a form like this for your students. OK? 
Okay? And then once the student hits submit, it dumps all that information into a spreadsheet within Google Docs. Okay? It's already typed out. It's already in a spreadsheet. You can download it as an Excel file if you'd like. You can format it. You can sort it. You can do a, a variety of spreadsheet type functions on that data once you've got it. Okay? So I'll show you how to create that as well. All right. Any questions on where we're going? I've kind of shown you the three integrations within Nika directly. Um, so now we're going to talk about how to create these things. Okay. Um, so what I have here is in another browser, I'm actually logged in as an instructor. Okay. So now we're looking at this from the instructor view. You'll see I've got several additional options to my course site here. The first thing we're going to talk about is the syllabus. How do you create that interactive syllabus to put in Nika? So as an instructor, I'm going to log into my Google Drive account. And if you haven't already created a Google Doc for your spreadsheet, you can click on Create and choose Document. Or if you have a Word document, you can choose Upload, and it will ask you if you want to convert it to a Google Doc format. You have to do this in a Google Doc format. You can't embed the Word file directly into Nika. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click Create because I'm going to start from scratch. And I'm going to click Create a New Document. First thing I need to do is I need to name the, the file. So up here where the title is, I'm going to click once, and just in that text box, I'm going to choose. I'm going to type in the word syllabus. Okay. At this point, I can start typing my syllabus. I can copy and paste from another application, um, and that's actually what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to pull up another document that I have somewhere. Um, let's see, I have a syllabus in here somewhere. So I have a course syllabus here. You know, I'm gonna copy just some of this text. Copy. And then in my new document, I'm just gonna hit paste. Okay? So I've got this text that I put into my new document. Now the important thing is this very next step. In order to make it interactive, to create that table of contents, you have to have headings in your document. Okay? If you have something that looks like this, where the student can't tell the difference between the heading and the actual text within that heading, Google Docs isn't going to be able to recognize it either. Okay, so what you have to do now is you have to um, identify where the headings are in your document. Yeah, Perry. Is there any glitches uh, if you underline in bold space uh, when you're going to create those headings, or it doesn't matter from the perspective of um, no, you do have to, there is a specific setting you have to do in Google Docs to identify something as a heading. You can do bold and underline on top of that if you wish, but there is a specific setting you have to do um, and that's actually the next step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this heading right here in Google Docs and I need to tell Google Docs that this is a heading. So up here at the top you've got an area that probably says normal text. Okay. If you click on that drop down menu, you have a series of options. Okay. For these headings, I'm going to choose heading 1. Okay. Title is like the title of the document. So if I were to put course syllabus up here, that's what I would do for title. But for these, these section headings, I'm going to choose heading 1. And when I do that, you'll see that it automatically adjusts the font size and makes it larger than the normal text. Now once that's done, you can go in and bold it and underline it if you'd like to. Okay. So you need to go through and identify all of your headings as actual headings. Okay. You can do subheadings as well. So I have a section here that's course objectives. If I wanted to make this specific course objectives a, let's say, a subheading, I can do that. I can highlight it. And then under this normal text here, I'm going to choose heading 2 because it's a subheading. Everybody with me so far? One quick question. So the, the, the proper thing to do is, be, before you upload the syllabus, is not to bold space anything or underline to, and do it after the setup. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. All right. So after we've gone through the document, we've got all our headings identified. Now we need to create that table of contents that makes it interactive for the students. 
Okay, and if you've done a table of contents in Microsoft Word, it's very similar. I'm going to go up to the top of the document here and add some extra space. And so I want my table of contents to be placed right here. All I'm going to do is go up to the insert menu at the top. And the last option is table of contents. Once I choose table of contents, it automatically creates that for me. And what you'll notice is for my subheading under course objectives, it indented it because it knows it's a subheading of the course objectives. Okay? Yes? Um, if you see it and you realize, oops, I made a mistake, mm -hmm. um, do you edit in here or do you have to go back? So let's say I want to get rid of this, this subheading. I, you know, I don't really need it as a subheading. I'm going to go back down here and I'm just going to highlight this and I'm going to change it back to normal text. Okay, so I'm going to remove the heading mark. All right. Then you go up here and you'll notice that it's still in the table of contents, but if I click inside this table of contents box, I have a refresh button. And if I click on that, it's going to research my doc, research through my document and update the table of contents based on that. So we should never edit within. Yeah, you don't need to. You can, but it's a little bit more work than it really needs to be. Okay. Now that you're, now that your uh, syllabus is done, now we need to embed this document within Nika for your students to get to it. The first thing you're going to do for that is you're going to click on share up here. But the top right hand corner. If this is a brand new document that you haven't done anything with before, you'll notice that at the very um, top of the who has access portion it says private and then it has your name below that. Okay. Private means only the explicit list of people listed here have access to this document. Okay, that's not necessarily what I want because then I have to go through and individually add all of my students. That's a little bit more work than it needs to be. So what I'm going to do is, next to private, I'm going to change this. And I'm going to say, anybody who has the link to this document can view it. Okay, so if I click on that, what that means is that anybody who has this URL, this really long, hard to understand URL, if somehow they were able to guess that, they could see this document. But the likelihood of that's pretty slim. Okay. The other thing to note is just because I'm saying anyone with the link doesn't mean students are given the link. So they can't pass that link to somebody else. Because you're embedding that link within Nika so students don't have access to it. So uh, if there's any kind of registration problem, once they're registered, they can link in. They can link. Correct. As long as they have access to Nika, they have access to the Google Doc. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing explicit you have to do there. So now that I've got that, I'm going to choose save at the bottom. But you could probably send them the link if the, if the students are interested. In oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a related question. Yeah, you can, you can absolutely send it to somebody else specifically if you'd like to. And so that if you add maybe another colleague, mm -hmm. they'll automatically be linked. Right. You, well, it, if you enroll them in the NECA site, they inherently have access to the, spread, right. to the syllabus. If you don't want them to have access to the NECA site, but you want them to have the syllabus, then send them the link directly to the syllabus. Okay. Yep. So now that you've hit save, up here at the top, you've got the link. This is the link you're going to copy and that we're going to embed inside of NECA. Okay. So it's, it's already highlighted, so I just have to hit copy. Now we're going to go back into NECA and actually do the link, do the embedding. Okay, it sounds a lot more difficult than it really is, but if I go back into my site, I'm going to access the syllabus tool. Now at this point, we're going to hit create or edit, just as if you were uploading a document. Okay, that step hasn't changed. This is the step that's changed. When you had a PDF or a Word document, you would click on add so that you could attach it. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to hit the redirect button. We're going to redirect the syllabus tool and point it to a Google Doc. Okay, so we're going to hit redirect. And at this point, it's asking you where are you redirecting that tool to. And in this box, you're going to paste that URL that you copied from Google Docs. So if I were to replace this with my new document and hit save, what you'll see now is the new syllabus that you have inside your course site. Now the options that you have right above the syllabus where it's got the name, file, edit, all this stuff, this is only appearing for you because you are also logged into Google. 
and you're the owner of this document. When a student goes in, since they're not the owner of this document and they don't have editing privileges to the document, all of this stuff disappears. They don't have that. So then what that says is we could go in via Nika to syllabus and edit it right there. You don't have to go into the, uh, the Google. That's Google. correct. Uh, okay. That's correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. The next. Can you tell me a question again? So to edit, if you needed to change your syllabus, when you go into the syllabus, as an instructor via your Nika tool, you've got all the editing, so you can modify your syllabus, which is modifying the Google Doc right there. You would not have to select Drive, find the folder that you have it in Google Drive, bring up the doc, and make the change there. When you bring it up right here, you're in edit mode for Google Doc. So it would change it on the, in the Drive, too. That's correct. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about um, is we're gonna do the student info form right now because that's actually a little bit easier than the, than the calendar part. So we're gonna go back into Google Drive. That's where we're gonna start again. And instead of creating a new document, we're gonna create a new form. So if you click on the create button at the top, one of the options is form. Actually, in some ways, the Google form is actually easier than embedding the Google document. So you're going to click on the Create button in the top left, choose Form, and the first thing it's going to ask you is to give it a title and what do you want the style to look like. It gives you a lot of preset templates, um, so you can call this whatever you want. Uh, I'm going to call it Student Form, and then I'm going to click Choose OK. And at this point, you start adding your questions. So right here, Question Title: What is your full name? Yeah, I did. You can also do help text. So <clears throat> oftentimes, for example, if you were to ask their hometown, students may ask, well, is that where I went to high school or is that where I was born? Because they are likely, you know, possibly two different places. So in help text here, you can say birthplace or where did you graduate high school or where does your family currently live? So you can add some additional text to help them be able to answer the question. Then question type. If you click on that, you have a variety of options. Text is just a single text line, okay, like name. Paragraph text is more like a short answer question, okay, it gives them more space than just a single line. Multiple choice, text, uh, check boxes, uh, choose from a list, which is just a drop down list. Uh, scale, grid, you can have them enter a date or a time and it will format it correctly. Okay. Yeah. So you could also, I'm jumping the gun, use this uh, if you wanted to create your own uh, course evaluation mm -hmm. form or uh, if you're running uh, something like a lab, uh, create a more interactive way where students can contribute on a one or on a team of, of two into another form as long as you create these explicitly different forms. Right. Now, the one thing I want to caution you on, if you're planning on using this to do your own course evaluation, is at the very top, and you can't see it when you first create the form, but if you actually scroll, oh, my screen froze. Let's try that again. There it goes. Okay, so if you scroll up more, you've got some form settings up here. You've got to be careful if you're doing a, a course evaluation mm -hmm. because it's set to require uh, a login to Google. And then there's a checkbox below it that automatically collects their usernames. Okay, so if you, in, if you truly intend for it to be anonymous, you need to make sure that this bottom checkbox is turned off. Otherwise, it's going to tell you who said what. Okay, and when students see, because it does, it does inform them as they're filling out the form that your username will be recorded. Thank you. So you've got to be careful about that part. But yeah. Okay, so once you're done with question one, you can click add item to go on and do more questions. Okay, but once you're done, all you have to do at the top is click on view live form. And this will open up the actual form for you to fill out if you wanted to. 
So I have an untitled question. I just have one option. If you had a more constructed form, it would be here. Um, but in order to embed this into Nika, all you have to do is copy the URL in the browser. Okay, so this link, this URL to the live form is what you're going to use to embed it into Nika. So if I click on that and copy it, I can then go into Nika and we're going to embed this using the web content tool. Okay, there isn't a, a specific tool for forms like there was for syllabus, but we're going to embed that using web content. So if we go into site info and then edit tools, we can click the checkbox for web content and the next screen will actually ask us for the URL which is where we're going to paste in what we copied from Google. Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. So we're going to go to site info in your course site. And then at the top of site info you're going to click on edit tools. And they're alphabetical so down at the W's is web content. And we shouldn't do that until we have the link ready. Yeah, because you can't add a web content tool without the link. providing a link. Okay. Okay. Can you change the link once you've added it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna click on that web that web content tool and click continue. And then here title, I'm gonna just call it info form, just to differentiate it from that other one. And then I'm gonna paste the form URL that I just copied. And then continue and finish. And once that's done, I have info form now on the side of my course site. If I click on that, it will allow the student to fill out the form. Yes? So uh, if, if one is generating application forms, even though Global Initiative has their own interactive forms, you could conceivably create it for a course like that you might be teaching over the summer or over the winter term so it's more interactive mm -hmm. for the student. The related uh, uh, question is when when students have to put in um, several sentences or a paragraph, are there restrictions on the length on, on the form? No, there's not. They can write in the site that you They could. Yeah, yeah they could. Isn't it kind of hard? I had them do that and I found it. I mean, it doesn't just yeah so that's how you that's how you view the responses through an Excel spreadsheet but there's nothing that that restricts the student when they're completing the form to a specific character limit so there's no way to avoid that it goes into the Excel spreadsheet um, for you to view the specific responses it has to go into an Excel spreadsheet. If you're looking for just a summary like statistics of how many students picked this option versus this option there's a way to do that without using the Excel spreadsheet um, but if you're looking for individual responses that is the only option. Alright so the next thing we're going to cover is doing um, office hours the office hour sign up sheets. So if I go back into the, the form editing area, okay. um, I can right here select choose response destination. And I'm going to tell it to dump all the responses into a new spreadsheet. Great. And so what you'll see is if I hit create here, and let's see if I can get it to load for me. There we go. So now you'll see you have a form that is called student form and then you have an Excel spreadsheet that are the responses. All right, the next thing we're going to do is the office hours. Um, so this is my personal calendar. So you as the instructor are going to log into your calendar. And I'm going to jump ahead, let's say, there we go. I've got some open time here. So during the second week of October, I have some open time. And let's say Monday afternoon I want to schedule office hours during this block. I'm going to click and drag on my calendar and you have to be in week view for this to work. So if you're in month view, switch over to week view for this. Okay. So on my, on my calendar I'm going to click and drag and create an event from 1 to 4 p.m. Once you let go of that click, a little pop-up window shows up. 
Okay, this is normally where you would put in the subject of the meeting or whatever the case is. The only thing I'm going to do differently is at the top, I'm going to click on appointment slots. So where it says event in the top left hand corner, click on appointment slots right next to it. And what if we already have the office hour in our calendar? Is there a way to um, go in? I don't believe so. It's only when you actually create it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. One frustration I have with the, the sign up is that it's only available through Mika and so only students registering the class. So if somebody like maybe interested in majoring wants to see me but they're not going to my class and mm -hmm. is that true of this as well? Yeah, so what there's a couple different ways you can use this. Um, and when we get a little bit further into this creation process, it will give you a link that we actually will take and embed into Nika, but you could actually email that link to a student who's interested in signing up for office hours, and so it would take them to the, the scheduling form. So you a public place they can go and that's correct. see where That's correct. Okay, so once you click on appointment slots, um, you can pre-fill in some of this information. So what, I'm gonna call this just office hours. And then what type of an office hour is this? Is this a one three hour block where only one student can sign up for that three hour block? Or do you want to take that block and split it up into smaller sections? Okay, so I'm going to choose the second one. And the default is a 30 minute office hour. You can set that to be whatever you want. I'll leave it as 30 minutes for, the, for right now. Okay. Once you're done with that, you're going to click on edit details. Um, at this point, you've got two additional text boxes at the bottom. So one of them is where. I'd recommend pre-filling in your office location. That way it appears in every single invite that gets sent out to your students. And then the description box. You can pre-fill in some information here. If you remember in my demo, the finished product, I said type your questions here. I just type that into this box and that's where it appears. So students can then highlight that and replace it with the actual questions that they have. You asked about recurring appointments. You can just click on the repeat button here and set up your recurring event. Okay. Once you're done with this section, the import, there's two important steps. The first one is to copy this link. This is the link we're going to embed into Nika, just like we did with the form through the web content tool. The other important thing is not to leave this page until you click the save button. If you go into Nika and paste this link without hitting save first, Nika is going to think you're crazy. Okay, so you've got to hit save because that's what actually makes it appear on your calendar. So if I hit save, now I have the office hour block set up on my calendar. Okay, yeah. When, when you're setting all this up, uh, is it always a good idea for your calendar uh, to make sure that your chair or department administrative assistant is also um, has access to your Nika to the calendar, or that's a different set of issues? I think that would be a different set of issues. I think we'd have to talk about why okay. why they need why the administrative assistant needs access. Um, if they're scheduling meetings, uh, for example, um, if you're on a search committee, make sure you're available on particular dates. Or um, that's that's a calendar that's a calendar sharing thing, which okay. is different okay. than okay. office okay. hours. I just to ask the dumb question. Thank but that would be a way for a student not in your class, perhaps, to schedule a time with you. Call the secretary, and if the secretary could get into the. You could send the secretary that link that we yeah. just copied, and then they could have access to it. That would be one option. And that way they wouldn't have to necessarily have explicit um, <coughs> rights to your calendar because your office hour slots are sort of public. Um, but yeah, you could send them that link as well. So once, you got, once you're all set here, you go back into your Nika site. You go back to site info, edit tools, add a web content tool. I'm not going to walk through all of those steps right now because we just did them. 
but where you insert that URL, just like we did with the form, you're going to paste that link that we copied from the Google Calendar. And you only have to paste the link once and add, like, if I added office hours the following week, it automatically knows? That's correct. Yep. All right. So what we're going to do now, we've sort of gone through all three of the, the big direct integrations within Nika. Can I ask one more question about calendar? Yeah. Um, as they fill up, do the students see that they're full or do they see who signed up? They do not see who signed up. They see that it's full. Okay. Yep. All right. So what we're going to talk about now, just for a couple of minutes, is Google Docs and how that works. How many of you have used Google Docs in your class? A little bit? Okay, so if you had, let's say as an example, you wanted your students to work together to put together a, um, a presentation outline for a group project that they're doing, okay? They could schedule a meeting outside of class, face-to-face, -face, sit down at you know the library or wherever, and write it out, and then type it, and then send it to you, or upload it into Nika, okay? Or, you could have them do it in a Google document. Okay. Now the way this would work is one of the students in that group would create a new document and they would immediately then invite the other people in their group. So let's say for example, I wanted I was, you know, maybe the, the lead person in my in my group. I go up here to create and create a new document. And I'd have to give that document a title before I can do any sharing. Okay, so I'm gonna say group outline. At this point, I can start inviting other students to collaborate on this document with me. To do that, on the top right-hand corner, we're going to click on Share. And Drew, I'm going to use you as an example. So I'm going to invite you to this and have you just sort of type away. Um, so inside this document, I want to leave it private because I don't want just anybody to have access to it. I obviously am the owner, but I want to invite specific other people. So down here at the bottom, there's a box where you can type in some names. And this does automatically look up in the directory. So if I were to type in Drew's name, it would automatically appear in the directory. And then what permissions do you want that person to have? Obviously, since we're collaborating, I want them to be able to edit this document. So I'm going to leave it at that. The other options are they can only view or they can only comment. And I'll show you about the commenting functionality in a minute. So once that's done, I can click Share and Save. And what that's going to do is it's going to add him to the explicit list. It's also going to send him an email saying I've shared this document with him. And it's going to provide him a link to be able to open that document. Okay. So I'm done with the sharing component. And at this point, I'm just waiting for him to come in. He doesn't necessarily have to be in the document for me to start typing. Okay. But what you'll notice in the top right-hand corner I now have a little icon here with the letter D. That informs me that somebody else is also in this document with me. And if I hover over it, I can see that it's Drew. Okay, and so Drew, in real time, is writing in this document with me. And so him and I can go through. Um, I can add some stuff. Um, he can add some stuff. And we're literally editing this in real time collaborating together okay now as he's as he continues you know typing or whatever I'm gonna move on to the next thing which is what else can you do with a Google Doc while you're editing it well up here in the top right hand corner next to share there's a comments button oh I'm sorry I had the wrong button next to comments there's a little chat icon and I can click on that and we can chat with each other about something before we edit, before we make that change in here, if we want to. So do I need to click that as well? No. So if you don't, actually, I'm going to close out of it, and you go ahead and click it and start chatting with me. Okay, I had to type, and then it came across. So. Yeah. Once a message is sent, then it appears on the screen for the other person. Okay. So the next thing is in addition to the actual chat, let's say Drew wrote something and I don't necessarily agree with it. 
I don't want to change it without talking to him first, without having a conversation about it. So what I can do is I can highlight this statement that I don't agree with. And I can go up here to insert, and I can insert a comment. And that allows me to say, hey, I see that you wrote this. I don't necessarily agree with it. Can you explain further? And if I type in that question and put it there, you'll see that there's a comment in the sidebar. And Drew can see it as well. So what Drew can do is he can click on my comment and add a reply. I'm hoping he's doing that while I'm talking. Okay. And I'm waiting. While he's replying, I have a question about sure. um, Google Docs in general. I teach Spanish, and so I need special characters. Mm -hmm. And I have not been able to figure out, like, I, I know the, the Microsoft shortcut keys for Word, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what the shortcut keys are inside Google Docs and or if they're even possible to do them. I know you can insert special characters. I don't know that there are shortcut keys. Okay, so it'd be the old thing where you go up. Insert and symbol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's. Mm -hmm. I'd have to do a little bit more research on that, but um, mm -hmm. but I think that's the the way to go about doing that. Okay. So Drew has replied to my comment over here. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> um, and so if I wanted to, I can click on that and I can continue replying. We can continue having a conversation. But let's say he posted something that I say, oh, I must have missed that class. I actually do agree with that statement now. I can post a comment that says that, but then I can hit resolve. And what resolve is going to do is it's going to remove the comment from immediate view. It's not going to delete the comment. It's just going to say this is no longer an issue. It's gone. Okay. Now, how do you see that history? How do you see that those comments took place? In the top right hand corner next to share, there's a comments button. And you can see the entire history of that specific comment. Okay? And I can say, maybe two weeks down the road, I can say, you know what, I, I went back and looked at what I missed during that class and I still don't agree with it. I can reopen the comment and it puts it back in the document. Yeah? So for added, as a faculty member, we can obviously see who's working on the outline by getting into that history, seeing who's contributing, and the implication is if, if uh, there's, a, there's a group paper who's doing the share, who's doing the editing. That's actually not the way I was going to recommend okay. looking at the history, but there is a way that you could see the history. So yes, there are a couple, let's say a document is finished and a student's ready to turn it in. They could just send you a link to the document. They could add you as a contributor to the document. They could print it as a PDF and upload it into Nika if you really if you want that gradebook integration, because there's no way to integrate the Nika gradebook with this right now. Okay. The problem with printing it as a PDF and uploading it to Nika is while you do get the gradebook integration, it does not show you the history. It just shows you the finished product. Okay. So the recommended way is Wait, go back. Yeah. It, yeah, so if a student, if a group is finished with this, they could print this as a PDF oh. and upload it in the assignments tool into Nika. Okay, but it's not up. Correct. So the recommended way is for the, the student group to add you as a contributor so that you can see what all has been done. Okay, so let's say I'm now the instructor in here and I want to see who has done what. I can go up to the file menu. And there's an option here that is see revision history. And if I click on that, it will show me every single change that was made, the timestamp that it was made, and who it was made by. Even if you have view only privileges, mm. you have to have like comment or edit. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Let's try that. So under the share, Drew, I'm going to change you to view only. And so what you're going to have to do is just hit refresh on your browser. And we'll see what he's able to, to take a look at. Okay, so you shouldn't be able to make any edits in the document. Uh, I cannot see revision history is grayed out. Okay, so you do have to have edit capability. How about comments? Uh, comments is going to be the same as view, but you'll be able to like highlight something and add a comment. Oh, in the I, I can see, see the comments. 
I oh, you're asking, can you see comments, not can you create comments? Can you, can you see revision history if you have comment permission? I do not believe so. Because okay. it's, it's supposed to be the same as view with the exception of being able to create comments. Okay. Um, I, I have students turn in the link to me and, and give them feedback via comments. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll reply to my comments. Mm -hmm. And I was like shocked because then it suddenly turned up in my email. Uh -huh. I, which I was pleasantly surprised because that let me know. I didn't have to go look. I knew mm -hmm. the response. Why did it turn up in my email? And is that just automatic or... Yeah, so if somebody replies to a comment that you posted, um, that's automatic. Right. You can change the notification settings for yourself in the Google Docs if you want. But everybody, okay, so sometimes it's a group that turns and then I put a comment on the group work. Do they get that in their email? Um, that depends on the notification settings. So they that's a, per person. So one person in the group may get it because they have their notifications turned on. Another group might not get it because they, or another person may not get it because they don't have their notifications. So I just on. happen to, the default is turn on and I just didn't know any better and that's why I get them? Because they replied to the comment that you posted. Okay. Since you were the original author of the comment and your replies go to you. Okay. Um, if then, then, okay, say I reply back, it goes to them and not to the whole group. Anybody who has commented in that thread gets a notification. Um, that is under, um, yeah, so under, if you click on comments at the top. Yep. Uh, so you can get all, and so you can have a group, and you can get notifications of what other people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We've got just a couple of minutes left, and there's one big topic that we haven't talked about yet, and that is Google Hangouts. Okay. Um, I can tell you right now that we're probably going to go over by a couple of minutes just because of the amount of time I know that it takes to cover it. So if you need to leave at 11 o'clock, I understand. All right, so Google Hangouts, what is it? It's a synchronous um, communication device that can be used for up to 10 people, including the host. So it's the host plus nine other people. You can do audio, video communication. So you can have a webcam and talking to the person that you're interacting with. There is a uh, text chat capability. So just like we were uh, chatting before in the Google Doc. You can screen share. So if I wanted to show something to somebody else, I can hit screen share and have them watch what I'm doing on my screen. You can pull up a Google document and collaborate while you've got that audio video communication going on. So if Drew was in his office and we were collaborating on this, we could do a Google Hangout and be collaborating while we're talking to each other, audio video communication. You can also synchronously watch a YouTube video. Okay, so if you, the assignment for your class is watch this video as a group and talk about it and you know write something about it, you can all go into the Google Hangout, open up that YouTube video, and watch it together in real time. Okay, um, so how do you get started with this? Okay, there are two things that I need to forewarn you about. The most capabilities is available. Wow, my English is awful. Um, you can get the most out of it if you have Google Chrome, if that's the browser that you are using. You can still do things in Firefox and Safari and probably even the most recent version of Internet Explorer, although don't hold me to that. Okay, but you can get the most capabilities out of it by using Chrome. Secondly, you can also get the most capabilities out of it if you have a Google Plus account. Now, just because you have a Google account where you have mail and docs does not automatically give you a Google Plus account. That's an action that you have to actually take to do that. It's very simple. I'm going to walk you through how to do it if you're interested. Okay. Um, Google Plus, if you're not familiar with it, is the social networking component to Google. It's like Facebook, but in the Google's environment. You don't have to use it actively in order to be able to use Google Hangout. You just have to create your account. That's it. Okay. The only information that I ask for to create your account is your name, um, your birthday, and your gender. That's it. And even for gender, there's another option. So you don't have to actually give them your gender. Okay. But once you set those three settings, you have a Google Plus account. And that gives you the most capabilities with, with Google Hangouts. Okay. So I have two computers set up here um, because I'm going to demonstrate to you, you know, it's a video conferencing platform. It's, it's best demonstrated when there's more than one person in there. Um, so what I'm going to do is 
um, I'm going to go back into the student, the student view. So this is my student's email address. Okay. There are three ways to create a Google Hangout, to start a Google Hangout. The first way is from within your email. Okay. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have a chat little widget here that shows up by default. The people that you interact with the most via email show up in here. Google automatically puts them here. You can add additional people by typing in their name or email address into this search box. It will search the directory and allow you to invite them to chat. If Google doesn't automatically put them in your chat window, then it's an invitation that is sent to that person and they have to accept the invitation. Okay? But um, I already have a, um, uh, I'm already friends with my students. I've already added them to my chat window. So what I could do here is next to their name, oops, that's not what I wanted. If I hover over their name, they get a little profile box. In the bottom, there's a little video icon. If you click on that, it will start a Google Hangout. It will send an invitation to the other person. They'll have to accept, and then you've got that Hangout going. The second way you can create a Google Hangout is from a calendar invitation, from a calendar event. Let's say you're doing this for department meetings, but you've got somebody over the Hamilton campus. You can set up, when you create the Google, the, um, Google Calendar invitation, you can tell Google to create a Hangout when this event starts, so that the person at the Hamilton campus, they can open up their invitation, click on the Google Hangout, and it will start a Hangout. Now, obviously, the other party over here in Oxford would have to be in there as well in order for it to work. But that's another way that you can create it. The third way you can start a Hangout is from within Google+. If you decide you want to use that social networking component, you can start one there. Okay, but you don't have to. But if I'm not already friends with you, I can't start a Hangout from you? Okay. Correct. You can... Um, I just looked you up and it doesn't give me the... Oh, if you type me. in just my last name, E-V-I-N-S... It should show. It should find me in the directory. It does, but it doesn't. Let, it doesn't have a little. Right. So what you have to do because I'm not already in your list, you have to click invite to chat. So a hangout is a chat. Well, it's it, it's one way to do a chat. Okay. Yeah. So what you'll see, and what I can do is I can switch over. So this is my personal email account. Down here in my chat window, it shows that I have two invitations waiting for me. The first one is Drew wants to add me to his buddy list. So on here, I'm gonna say yes. And then I have one that says you want to add me to your buddy list. And I'm gonna hit yes. Before I hit yes, I will appear in your buddy list, but it will say invited next to it. Okay. And so when I hit yes, that invited will go away and it will show that I'm available. Okay, yes? I'm not seeing that, <clears throat> that little chat thing at the bottom. Um, so Mine's at the right hand side. It's not yeah, right. it, sometimes it depends on which, um, which things you have turned on. If it's not turned on, at the bottom of that column, there's a little chat icon. And if you click on that, it should pop up. Oh, there we go. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so. Those are some of the options you have for starting one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, click here. And of course I clicked, which is not what I wanted to do. Um, and then I'm going to choose video. There it is. OK. So add people to this call. I can add more people if I wanted to. So let's say um, I wanted to add Perry. And him and I aren't in that, that list. Or you know I'm not on his chat window. I could insert his email address here and it would send him an invite. Okay, this little area is not available until you start a Google Hangout. Okay, so it's kind of difficult to get to the point where you can add somebody just by email address. But you can. And then I'm going to hit submit. So this is the interface. Okay, waiting for other people to join the video call. What it's actually done on my, on my personal account is it gives me a little pop-up notification that says this person wants to start a hangout with you. And so I'm going to choose join. And so now you can see that there's multiple people in this window. Okay. If you're only doing a video audio conversation, the person who's actively talking, their picture is the big one. 
but everybody's everybody's little screenshots are down here. Okay, so if person if person B on the other end starts talking, their picture jumps up here as being the active talker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it may actually put them side by side. Um, okay, so once you're in the, the Hangout, you've got several options down here on the side. You can invite additional people. Um, the, there's a text chat, which is over here on the right-hand side, so we can start typing to each other if we wanted to. We can do the screen share, like I mentioned. Um, if we wanted to share a Google Doc and start collaborating on a Google Doc while we've got this audio video connection going, I can choose Google Drive and it will actually walk me through picking which file we want to share. So in my drive this is sort of an outline that I've got. I click it, I hit select and it shows up here. Okay. Now the other person has to have rights to this document or it's not going to appear. Just because you're sharing it in Google, a Google Hangout does not give them rights. Now, if you open this document and they don't have rights, they're going to have a little pop-up message that says, you don't have access to see this, with a button that says request access. And it will then send a message to person A to gain access. Okay? Yes? So quickly, if, if, you're, if a student is doing uh, the video conferencing with you uh, in lieu of a physical office, um, uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes and what they're discussing with you is somewhat confidential how there's no way to record this or avoid the recording um, the for confidentiality yeah there is I've got to remember where it is You know, I don't actually think it's turned on inside of the Miami OH area. Okay. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research. There's something called, uh, was it Hangout on Air or something like that? That is actually a recording capability within Google Hangouts. I'd have to do some double checking because I'm not seeing it within here right now. So it might not even be turned on inside of okay. Miami OH. I they can? Yeah, it, it, then it creates a YouTube video that goes to their YouTube Well, that's channel. what I was worried about. Sometimes yeah. I But you have to actively do it. It doesn't just happen. Okay, I was just worried about legal implications. Um, and then they know because there's like a little, it, it tells you you're on there. Oops. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'd have to do a little bit of, dig, of checking to find out how to go about setting that um, or, you know, where to look for that notification. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this is how many of you get calls or emails from your students with technical questions? Help, Nika's not working the way it's supposed to. I know Drew does because he teaches in computer science. Okay. Um, in Google Hangout, there's a remote desktop component, which allows you not only to share a desktop, but allows somebody else to control your screen. So if you've got somebody who emails you and says, help, I can't figure out how to submit my file in Nika, or I can't figure out how to share this Google Doc with somebody, you can start a remote desktop, and while they're sitting at their computer, you can control their screen so that they can see exactly where they should have gone in order to make that happen. Okay, This works by, if you click on it, so when you click on this, it says, are you helping the other person or are you requesting help from them? Okay, and that, that way Google knows who to give access to. Does yes. that legally protect us in any way? I mean, I always worry about what are the legal implications for doing X, Y, or Z. Well, the, the students watch, the other person's watching you the entire time. Okay. So they have complete control over everything, and they can turn off the remote desktop if, if they choose to. So, yeah, they have to, they have to consent for that to happen. Okay, they, you know, just like going to the help desk. Right. So that's Google Hangout in a nutshell. There's a lot more you can do with it, but those are some of the basics. And like I promised, we're a couple minutes over. Um, but that's, that's it for this training.